Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon. We would like to start the conference of today. And I would like to ask all of the guests to sit down, if possible. And uh, first of all, I would like to tell some words about the program of this afternoon. We will have three lectures. All of the lectures will be 25 minutes. And on the end of the lectures, we will have like five minutes of questions of answers and answers. Um, uh, first lecturer will be Arianna Rinaldo. Then we will listen Roman Beziak's presentation. And then we will have a small coffee break, which will uh, be 15 minutes from 6 o'clock till uh, quarter past six, and then we will have a last lecture by Liz Wells, and on the end we will have a roundtable discussion. But just to introduce this project, what is realized here, is the second part of a conference which was organized by the MoMA University, and which is focusing on the question of East European identity. And in the first part, what we organized in the last semester, on the end of the, uh, uh, of the uh, semester, was, um, was, uh, was, a, was still an online conference where all of the participants were East European or Middle Europeans, but uh, we missed to hear some outsider opinions. So we felt necessary to organize the second part where the lecturers will um, uh, present another point of view, and we are very excited to, um, to hear their words and to get to a conclusion in the roundtable discussion. Arianna Rinaldo is an independent curator, a freelance photo editor and photo consultant, but she is also an organizer of a festival which is called Cortona on the Move, which maybe she will not touch in her presentation, but uh, I think that we will also ask some questions about this on the end of the day. And um, from a technical point of view, she is not present now, and uh, she recorded her lecture. So the first lecture will uh, be presented on the screen. But as far as we know, she hears us, so if there are not any technical troubles, she will also be able to answer to some questions. But don't forget that we just have five minutes after every lecture, so if somebody would like to get into a deeper analysis, then let's keep these opinions till the roundtable discussion. So I am giving the screen, not the floor, to Ariana now, and let's uh, hear her lecture now. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Arianna Rinaldo and I'm talking to you from Barcelona. I'm sorry I cannot be there in person. I would like to thank the committee for inviting me to the symposium. I'm very honored. My talk today will be an informal grand tour on through Italy's landscape photography. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and show you some works and photographers that I would like to discuss. So the abstract of my talk. After the Renaissance, Italy became one of the destinations of the grand tour undertaken by young aristocrats through Europe. The Bel Paese, which means beautiful country, was known for its artistic and natural beauties. Beautiful paintings and touristic postcards abound. The standardized view of the beauty of Italian landscapes triggered a trend in photography that challenged the stereotype with the scope of showing a more realistic landscape and also brought to light a deeper discussion on a more conceptual visual research and the politics of representation. The initial protagonists of this visual revolution have set the tone and are nowadays followed by new landscape photographers that deal with contemporary issues 
related to social identities and environmental concerns, where the natural or urban view stands for a much more important and powerful signifier. So the context of the lecture, first of all, I want to explain the approach and scope of the work, and then we'll go through ideas connected to the Italian landscape school, where this originates, the idea of Italy and the Grand Tour, and the influence of the United States and the new topographics. And then a quick overview through the masters, the initiators of this landscape school, the followers and the new generation where I would like to focus a little bit more the attention. So as for the approach and scope of the lecture, first of all, I want to make a personal premise. I am not an academic, so I'm not used to a rigorous research method. I'm a photo editor and curator and artistic director, and I therefore would like to do this lecture based on my experience. Of course, there will be historical reference points, um, which are not, again, exhaustive. I'm not going through the whole history of landscape photography in Italy. But I really would like to focus more on the contemporary trends and the contemporary practices. Most of this is all based on my personal experience. And it's kind of an experimental lecture that I'd like to go through with you. The scope of the work of the lecture is to open doors and trigger reflections. First of all, to look into the connections between a country's photography trend and its history and geography. And more importantly, the legacy of the history of photography and the masters and the trends in photography on contemporary practices and how one subject matter, like in this case, landscape, continues to be viewed in different ways. Luigi Ghirri master of landscape photography, said in, his, in photography, the deletion of the space that surrounds the framed image is as important as what is represented. It is thanks to this deletion that the image takes on meaning, inviting us to see the rest of reality that is not represented. Of course, this quote refers to photography in general, of what is left out of the picture, out of the frame. But specifically, in this case, I am putting it into perspective in landscape photography. So when we talk about the Italian landscape school, I put a big question mark because it's not really something that has been um, uh, formalized. Um, there is often a talk about Italian landscape school, often in quotations mark, quotation marks, because since the 1970s, it's true that there has been a focus on landscape among Italian photographers. Specifically, in 1984, um, this book was published, which was also an exhibition curated by Luigi Ghirri, Gianni Leone, and Enzo Velati. It's about 300 pictures um, with texts by Gianni Celati and Arturo Carlo Quintavalle, an art critic. It's made of commission work, where 20 photographers were sent out to offer a new view of Italy. It's kind of an emotional and intellectual trip. Gabriele Basilico, Gian Antonio Battistella, Giovanni Caramonte, a lot of photographers that made the history of Italian photography went on to this trip. So can we define it as a school? Can we define this trend as a school? It depends, of course, if we define a school for its attention towards a theme or its methodology and coherent vision. If we refer to the theme, of course, yes, there is a trend in Italian photography to focus on landscape. And we'll see through the lecture today how it has its uh, original styles and variables. Um, but if we talk about a coherent vision, then we cannot call it a school because each and every one of these photographers, the masters, the followers, the new generations have a very specific and unique view on landscape. So where does this focus on landscape photography originate. If you really go back, we can talk about Italy and the Grand Tour. Going through history, since the 17th century, Italy has been the destination for the young, mostly British aristocrats, and later the new bourgeoisie. The Bel Paese, the famous Bel Paese, beautiful country, is mystified and immortalized, first by painters, and later by photographers. 
So the focus on landscape and on the beauty of landscape and the historical landmarks begins back in the 17th century and specifically then with photography since the beginning of photography. The postcard, the, um, the postcard, the veduta italiana is part of the, um, uh, of the visual culture at the time. Uh, we have to remember that we come to this time, the 70s, 80s, before with the uh, tradition of muralism beyond, be, before that, which is photography very much focused on social issues. So this was a big change. And certainly the United States and the new topographics were a big influence on this. So the photography trend in the US in the 70s was revolutionary. In 1975, William Jenks, Jenkins curated the exhibition at George Eastman House in Rochester called New Topographics, photo Photographs of a Man Altered Landscape, where landscape is not anymore an idealized version, a romantic version of the territory, but the rules of landscape photography completely change. Aesthetics are new, the concept of new. There are eight then young American photographers, which you see listed here, together with um, Berndenila Becher from Germany. Uh, among these photographers, you will see um, only Stephen Shore is the one that uses and shot colored film. So here are just a few images to give you an idea of how the new topographics show landscape as not necessarily beautiful, where man's intervention is visible where the ordinary and the everyday life is shown. So coming back to Italy, the initiators, let's say the masters of the landscape photography um, are those that shift the focus from beautiful landscape and historical landmarks to non-spaces, emptiness, the marginal, the transformation of the landscape. Landscape becomes a social document. The vision of the territory is realistic. Landscape talks about the men and women that live in it. So this is the first generation that with awareness begins to develop a different approach and concept to landscape photography. First of all, Luigi Ghirri with his unique sensibility. Images, even the banal ones, become the trigger to think beyond the shown landscape. A photograph is one's own perception of what is outside. Images are a way of thinking. The insignificant details become important. I saw in photography a great adventure, says Giri, both of thought and gaze, where the camera is a great magical toy capable of bringing together the great and the small. Illusions and reality, time and space, our adult awareness and the fairy tale world of childhood. This explains his approach to photography it, with the wonder Eye, the eye of a child, sometimes with a little bit of irony, where emptiness and the insignificant becomes important, where he views the viewer or who is looking at the landscape. In this case, it's one of the very few images where people are in his pictures. Up to the point that his work with Atlante, the Atlas, becomes completely conceptual. Um, in Atlante, the landscapes are actually made of pictures and samples from the atlas itself, pieces of maps. Another one of the initiators of masters is Gabriele Basilico. He's an architect and he looks at the city as an architect, in a city in transformation, a city where town planning is key. His images are meditations on urban planning where the new idea of the edge, the border, the periphery, the changes in the cities are key. Through his architectural view, he basically tends to bring balance and order into chaos in what is usually urban living. Some images here are not necessarily from Italy. This is Rome. 
Gabriele Basilico was the only Italian called in 1984 to work in the photographic mission of the Delegation for Regional Planning in France, Datar. The third initiator or master I'm, I'm talking about is Mimmo Iodice. These three are very different one from the others. There's also, sorry, there's many others, but um, these I chose these three because they're very different one from the other and they propose a very different approach. So Mimmo Iodice is from Naples. His view is more metaphysical and conceptual. He's more interested and influenced by surrealist aesthetics. So his research is into silence, emptiness, and absence. Others, masters are Guido Guidi and Giovanni Chiaramonte, to name a few. The followers offer different visions on the landscape. Landscape, yes, is beautiful, is conceptual, but it has a lot of layers of significance in it. Landscape photography is an interpretation of reality. Focus is on urban settings, on transformations and changes, but landscape also offers a reading on society. It talks about the men and the women that live in it, but at the same time, it doesn't lose its aesthetics and conceptual approach. So here we talk about Massimo Vitali, which I'm sure most of you know, and his beach and leisure, leisure scenes. His images of a rarefied and milky beauty are of mass leisure events. Usually it, they focus on the interaction among people in the environment. He's an observer, often from a high viewpoint, <coughs> almost a voyeur, we could say. And his images, which are mostly on beaches, but not only, are always printed in very, very large scale. Walter Niedermeyer from Bolzano views the environment as an occupied space shaped by men. So his work, often in diptych and also in very large scale, um, refers to the relationship and interference between men and the environment. His images are also quite rarefied. There's often this contrast between what is real and what is ephemeral, what is the representation and what is could be imagined. So we're never sure if the images are real. Olivo Barbieri offers a destabilizing view. His new perspective in photography is that of aerial photography, but in such a way that the images become miniatures. They, again, they don't look real. They could be fake or imagined. There's a completely different dimension in the landscape that we're looking at. On the other side, Massimo Siragusa is very precise. He creates a stage. Uh, one of his works is called Teatro d'Italia, Theater of Italy. He scans the full territory in Italy. He looks at the ordinary and the extraordinary, the historical, the beautiful landmarks, but also the mundane. Everything is set in an almost unreal light. It looks like a theater setting. Most of the time there are no people, and if they are there, they are not really important, or not the key part of the image, like in the case of Massimo Itali and Niedermeyer, where there's an influence or there's an interaction. And most of his images have this very precise frontal view. Again, not only of beautiful historical landmarks, but also the mundane, like a parking lot or a shopping mall. With Francesco Iodice, we move into visual anthropology, what he calls urban visual anthropology, where landscape is desire. Landscape represent modern social behavior. Um, with his images, not only photography, but he also works with video and maps. He is an architect. He analyzes how urban transformation affects social behavior, how landscape, in this case is not always just Italy, uh, represent our desires. His, one of his famous works is called What We Want, and it's all made of landscape images and how they somehow reflect 
our desires. Now, to come to the new generation, which is what I wanted to focus on a little bit more and to see how they continue with this trend and attention on landscape and the layering of meanings and significance over it. They bring together all the elements, the conceptual, the social, the aesthetics, the beauty. Landscapes trace humankind's history and practice. With the new generation, social issues and history strongly enter the frame. Environment and ecological concerns take over. Human traces are everywhere. Landca landscape becomes memory. Landscape becomes a way to report a problem, an issue. Landscape still is everyday life. Giorgio Barrera, to start with, embeds history into his landscape. That's where we find traces of history. Uh, landscapes and his work are reflections on history and the present. What is after what has been? His work, Battlefields, looks into areas where important battles were fought in the three important um, Italian wars that led up to the unification of the country in 1860. The images are beautiful. There's no real traces. There's hidden traces of the historical moments which he reveals through the text. The images are beautiful and are evocative. They're almost non-documents. Andrea Botto transforms the landscape into an unstable landscape where time and transformation are key. His interest in geology and the environment and more specifically the aesthetics of destruction. His images are ambiguous. This specific work called Kaboom um, focuses on non-military explosions, like schedules, explosions, like demolitions. So the images itself become metaphors of this human behavior, but at the same time, they're ambiguous and they're not graspable initially. They are not meant to be documents of these explosions or these demolitions. According to him, it is said that the artist is like a seismograph as he is the first to detect the slightest tremor or change to take in place in front of his eyes. Now the work of Terra Project, a collective of four photographers based specifically in Florence and Tuscany. They work mostly with investigative journalism and documentation. And one of their key themes are natural disasters taking place in Italy, social environmental issues. So landscape becomes a document, becomes information. They often denounce and report the aftermath of disasters. Like in this work, the Semi di Pietre of seeds and rocks, where the aftermath of, land, of earthquakes in some parts of Italy are the key theme. And landscape becomes a landscape of catastrophe. Another work of theirs, and they often work with the square format, is the new towns, the reconstructions after an earthquake and after a natural disaster. Again, with all that social and economical implications that that implies. Another work of one of the members of the collective, Michele Borzoni, is called How to Social Distance. This is a recent one from last year during COVID times and coronavirus crisis, where the landscape shows us how we were interacting as human beings, how the distance was interspersed within everyday landscape images. Giuseppe Mocha and the Third Landscape what is left of landscapes after human activities. Actually, natural cycles includes man's intervention according to the theory of the third landscape. And Giuseppe looks into the forces that shape our landscape. According to Gilles Clément, which 
wrote the manifesto of the third landscape. It is the sum of the space left over by man to landscape evolution, to nature alone. This can be considered as the genetic reservoir of the planet, the space of the future. So Mocha's work is specifically on some areas of the Dolomites where ski slopes are abandoned after a big event, after the Winter Olympics, or because snow doesn't get to that um, levels anymore. And the elements of the ski slopes and the tools of the ski slopes remain as part, integral part of the landscape, the third landscape. Marina Caneve, the vulnerable soil. Marina's work is multidisciplinary and is very much research-based with a lot of connection also to scientific and to geology. She often works with these type of experts to look into the landscape as a tool for knowledge. Specifically, she's interested, interested in the indetermination and the vulnerability of landscape. She also founded Calamita Project, which focuses on catastrophes. Here are a few of her images, where again, the landscape talks about the vulnerability. the imminent catastrophe. And she works mostly in the areas where she was born, which is the Dolomites. That is her main focus. Marco Zorzanello, um, the tourist trace. Again, landscape becomes a space where men live where men interact and is profoundly affected and changed and transformed by men's behavior. He specifically focuses on tourism in the climate change area. So again, environment and social issues strongly come into the frame with these new generation of landscape photographers. Marco Zorzanello, by the way, won the CIMOI Photojournalism Award in 2020. So his look into tourism is, is completely different. It doesn't have that um, ironic or um, um, fun approach, but a very important documentary and very strong view of how the tourist business models landscape. Now his work is taken different parts of the world, not only Italy, but always without focus. Now the last of the young photographers I'm showing you is Mattia Marzorati, the scarred landscape. His work deals with politics and geopolitics, specifically in an area of Italy called Brescia, which is his town, where the mining sector is still quite key. The work is called The Land of Holes, and is, it is denouncing, uh, it's a report on this social issue and the effects of industry on landscape and on the population. Pollution and destructions are themes that he brings into the images and the frame. So with his landscape photography, he actually questions the business model of our society. So the final thoughts or conclusions. Again, I would like to remind you that my research is not based on a rigorous method, but it's an experiential, based on my experience, view, grand tour through Italy's landscape photography, an informal grand tour. So I wanted to give you some brief insights into Italy's landscape photography school. And again, in quotes, because it is not really formalized or institutionalized as a school, but has a trend and attention to the theme of the landscape and its role and interpretation of society. 
this role interpretation of the landscape change from the Bel Paese, the beautiful country, to the environmental disaster zone that we saw in the last few works. So a theme, in this case, the landscape, reflects social, political, economical issues. And this overview of photography and of photographers that I've brought you with um, kind of shows all the different and possible views on the landscape. No photographer stands alone, as we saw. One is at the end of the line, but then it also at the beginning of another line. And no photographer lives in a bubble, so it's affected by its surroundings. I hope that this informal overview was hopefully something new and hopefully offered some reflections and some novelty and some new information on Italy's landscape photography and how the country's photography trend is very much related to its history and geography. Of course, Italy has many other forms of um, photography and styles and genre of photography as well, but I really wanted to focus on this one because it has been a constant and has been an interesting variation and transformation of a way of looking into our territory and reflecting our society in it. Thank you very much. I would like to introduce our next lecturer, Roman Beziak, who is a professor of photography at the Bielefeld University of Applied Sciences and have a long history in relation with the MoMA University. So please, Roman, come and share your ideas with us, Archaeology of an Era, Divided Sky, as I read on the screen your present title of your presentation. Thank you very much. So, first of all, I want to thank you uh, for invitation to MOME. I'm really happy to return after, I think, more than 10 years. And everything changed here. Uh, when I was here a long time ago, uh, I cannot recognize this place anymore, except these buildings, which is uh, still was existing to this time. So I will give you an uh, overview of uh, my work, and it is entitled um, Identity of a German-Slovenian Photographer. And you will uh, easily see why I have posed this, uh, um, this uh, topic. So when I started to be a photographer, uh, Europe and the whole world changed. So we wrote the year 1989, fall of Iron Curtain, fall of Berlin Wall, dissolution of the communist countries, fall of Soviet Union, and transformation processes in East Europe, uh, society and economic, uh, economic expulsion and war in Yugoslavia, my homeland, and the relationship between West and East was redefined. So, it uh, was redefined. Okay, where I am. Much later, in 2013, when I organized a symposium in Bielefeld on East European photography, Boris Buden described this East-West relationship as follows. The West looks at the East with a hegemonical gaze, a gaze which sees in the post-communistic East a space of cultural belatedness. A time space in which the Eastern societies were driven, were driven by the desire to catch up on what has been achieved in the West, modernity, economical success, democracy, and so on. A gaze which search for confirmation 
of the Western superiority. This quote would have spoken of my soul if I had known this to that time, because uh, this winner mentality towards the East, especially from Germany, was very large in that time. Through my Slovenian family, through my stays in Yugoslavia during my childhood, and through my Yugoslavian and Slovenian relatives, I had a different attitude to the East. And so I spent a lot of time in uh, East Europe and was photographing for the Frankfurter Allgemeine magazine. And I wasn't looking for sensation, I was looking more for everyday life. So I will show you some. Okay. This is a passing. Yes. So I was traveling in many, many places like here in Sofia or in here in Trans. Missing a vacation day, Black Sea Coast, the Big of Sea, which is a big steel factory. So these are the images from the 1990s. The first gambling hall in Budapest, uh, in Bucharest, sorry. <laughs> Bucharest. <laughs> We are in here at the Philharmonic Orchestra and Sophia again in an area which will later be important for me, this outskirts of the cities in East Europe. But to this time I didn't pay attention to this kind of architecture. And here we are in Poland, again in Tiraspol, in Transnistria. Then that, uh, so this is a magazine narrative photography I did to these times. Here we are in Nagorny Karabakh, and in Kiev. And these uh, stories have been published over ten years in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Magazin, which was a color supplement of the major paper Frankfurter Allgemeine. And it looks like this here, a story about Kabul and Afghanistan, which more or less I counted also to the post-communistic area. So as a migrant in Germany, I am in this classical immigrant situation. Neither a Slovene nor completely a German. Therefore, I have found my identity research in photography, in which I have dealt with the East for decades, up to the teaching as professor, in which I have organized a symposium in East European photography and invited photographers and theoreticians from the East of the Conference. Vladimir Birgos described the development of photography in Czech Republic under the communist regime in the 1960s and 1970s. Documentary photography was dominated in its treatment of the political consequences of the Prague Spring in 1968. In the 1980s, it was the stage photography that established itself as a sign of inner immigration. Aryan Kudash, who has also been guest in Bielefeld, uh, presented himself as the one which is described in your symposium text as the second generation. The second generation received its uh, artistic education in the 90s they had possibility to travel, to get international grants, and to be part of a global photographic life. And Abel Zalantine has drawn attention to the growing number of internationalization of the Hungarian students who take part in the global discourse and, uh, ma and, and market during the stay in abroad. So after my professional career as photographer. I became professor at a university in Bielefeld 
in 2000. From then on, I was disconnected from the magazine market, and so I had to find a own task. I have to set up a own topic, and so I started in the research of the project Socialist Modernism, or Archaeology of an Era. So when I started this project, I was asking myself, so I started this project in Belgrade in 2005. I was asking myself, what is left of Yugoslavia as a freelance Yugoslav who knew the country only from a perspective of an emigrant? I nevertheless, or perhaps because of this, I had a great sympathy for my homeland. The wars of the 1990s brought not only much human suffering, but also a loss of a European cultural, um, cultural area. What remains of this cultural space in the follow-up states of Yugoslavia are the architectural gestures of social awakening and their utopias expressed in the post-war modernism. So, I realized that this is not only the issue in ex-Yugoslavia, it is also in GDR, East Germany, and in the whole post-communistic post area in Europe. And so I decided to travel to every capital city of these new uh, countries in East Europe. And here, for instance, we are in Sarajevo, or here we are in Skopje. I did the post office there. Oh, this is Tirana in Albania. In Constanza, Romania. And uh, not only the question what is the need of uh, socialistic societies, was uh, the question it is a uh, project. There was a second guide question, and it was the tension or the symbiotic relationship between beauty, ness, and ugliness. The German philosopher Karl Rosenkranz wrote 1853 a book about the aesthetic of ugliness. And he said, ugliness is not the absence of beauty, but its positive negation. Post-war post uh, post modernism buildings in both East and West are commonly perceived as ugly by the wider audience. I felt this the same 30 years ago until I began to deal with that topic. Because even we cannot say the buildings are beautiful, but there is an interesting tipping point in which state falls into its opposite. Ugliness and beauty. Or to say it more simple, beauty is in the eye of the observer. Yes, Bratislava, you know it, I'm sure. The new National Museum. That's the opera house in Kharkiv in Ukraine. And a department store also in Kharkiv. And this is St. Petersburg. And that's the way the images are exhibited in different stations. So after this I was looking for a new topic and I decided to to stay with this uh, socialistic architecture and uh, find other spots where it might be interesting. So I went to Pyongyang. The North Korean capital was almost completely destroyed after the Korean War and offered architects and urban planners the opportunity to build a model city of socialist architecture. So I was there for two weeks, and I had, of course, two people taking care of me, Mr. Kim and Mr. O. They speak very well German, 
and uh, everything I wanted to photograph, I had to apply for it. So I have to give a motive list, uh, which monuments and which buildings I want to photograph. And then we did it constantly day after day. And that was easy working in this time. What particularly interested me also in uh, Pyongyang is the size relationship between men and architecture. The monumentality of the settings that makes men seem small and weak. So this kindergarten I wanted also to photograph and for that I had to apply to the ministry again and it took three days that we get permission to make photographs in this kindergarten. And uh, the last station of this project is Tashkent. Tashkent, which is considered as a symbol of Soviet modernism and an open-air museum of socialistic architecture. The devastating earthquake in 1966 uh, gave the urban planners and the architects again, like in Pyongyang, the situation of building a new uh, socialist city. Tashkent became an experimental laboratory of modern architecture with countless prefabricated buildings. So the architects combined structural requirements with the local tradition and uh, with ornamental mosaics, ornaments decorating the facades of the prefabricated panels. And this work I divided in two parts. So this uh, first image, as you see, is the classical cityscape or landscape photography, as we saw in the previous uh, lecture as well, with the strict rules of architectural photography. We can see the context of the city, we see people, we see streets, we see cars. And uh, the second layer in this uh, work was that I started, this is the Registran in Samarkand, which I traveled to to uh, photograph these uh, historical ornaments, which we find also on the uh, panels of the prefabricated buildings. So in the second uh, way of telling this Tashkent architectural story is to photograph the facades from a very deep viewpoint. So here the lines are not uh, any more um, uh, regular like in these uh, uh, photographs before. They are tumbling and the horizon is shifting. And I photograph the same facade from slightly different positions and uh, brought it together in diptychs and triptychs. And this is the idea that uh, we see a difference in the seemingly same.
And that's the way how I show it in exhibitions. So after I finished Tashkent, the Skopje 2040 construction project caught my interest. And here something reverse happened. Not the utopia of a promising future is evoked here, but the idea are aimed in the opposite direction in the past. Not utopia, but retropia. In Skopje, a past is being created that never exists. A myth around Alexander the Great in, uh, was invented to give North Macedonian a national identity. But not much different happened in Berlin. Recently, the um, castle of the German Kaiser was rebuilt in the center of Berlin, exactly on that place uh, where the Palace of Republic of the GDR used to stand. That means uh, that means uh, that the center of Berlin has been historically cleansed. A co continuity into the 18th century is given, which did not exist. The Second World War and the socialist period of Germany was erased. So I dedicate, uh, I decided to take closer look to this reconstruction topic, to buildings which are old looking, but all of them are brand new. Here, for instance, we are in Braunschweig, also a castle which was rebuilt. Inside is the modern shopping mall. You can see here that this building from the 70s is older than the, the castle. Or here we are in Frankfurt in the new old city. And the biggest Jesus sculpture is not standing in Rio de Janeiro. It is standing not far away from Poznan in West Poland. So uh, here we are in Warsaw. And uh, Warsaw was for me a very interesting point because I was a little bit skeptic about this reconstruction issue. And in Warsaw, I understood why people are, have reconstructed the old city. Warsaw was bombed by the Nazis intentionally to erase the national cultural identity of the Polish. And uh, after the uh, Second World War, the Polish people decided to rebuild the old city, also as a sign of cultural um, survivalness or uh, to get back to a state of cultural identity. Uh, if one can agree that modernism was nourished by left-wing ideas, one could come to the thesis that uh, reconstructions are nourished by right-wing ideas. This thesis interests me, and I try to look at the motivation of the buildings in the different projects. The reconstruction of historical building is very popular among the general public. The loss of the beautiful old is perceived as an aesthetic decrease, which can only be healed by the restoring of the lost buildings. Okay, here, here are two motives you might know in Budapest. I will come later to this question. Um, in the last 20 years, conservative or right-wing parties have gained power throughout Europe. Right-wing parties are represented in the parliament of Germany, 
France, Italy, Poland, Slovenia, Hungary, Serbia, and um, for example, or even their government. The program of the right uh, denies the emancipatory achievements of the 1968 generation and wants to turn back the wheel of history, back into the city of clear defined nation states with suitable people, back to the European city of the 18th and 19th century in order to reinterpret history and to overdrive, uh, to override historical disasters of the 20th century. That has implications of the urban planning. Here, for instance, we are in Poland, and that is also a historical uh, city which was destroyed in the Second World War, but they decided just to keep the matrix of the old city, but they uh, took modern shape of these uh, buildings also for modern requirements. This is Glogov West in West Poland, or here at the Baltic Sea, uh, Elblak, which is also nowadays a very popular kind of uh, um, um, uh, building a city, and it's also economically very powerful because these uh, houses are not uh, uh, really reconstructed to the end, but they are sold out already. And the Peter's Dome is standing in a village in Poland. It's kind of reconstruction of the Peter's Dome. Or the castle in Vilnius. The Schwarzhäupter House in Riga which is uh, architecture from the 15th century. And this uh, quarter in Kiev was rebuilt in the style of the 18th century. Also in Kiev, this is quite interesting, you see the St. Michael's Monastery in the right side of the image and left you see the foreign ministry uh, from the Stalin time. So this, uh, the monastery was uh, erased by Stalin and the plan was to build an ensemble which the first part you can see in the left side here where the monastery is there should be a big dome, a Stalinistic dome and also on the right side um, similar building like uh, the forest ministry this plan wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't done, and in 2000 they have rebuilt the uh, Michael's Monastery. Or the Frauenkirche in Dresden, and the quarter around it, the new old city also in Dresden. Or Potsdam, the castle, which is the parliament. And also here you see the oldest building is this uh, socialist hotel in the, on the horizon. Or the Knochenhauer Amtshaus in Hildesheim, a small city in Germany. In Worms, a Jewish synagogue from the 15th century, which belongs nowadays to the World Heritage. And this is a special thing, the reconstructive or the recro, uh, retrospective architecture. Here in Holland, they take Dutch symbols and elements and combine it to this huge architecture of this hotel in Sandam near Amsterdam. Or in Serbia, uh, Emir Kostorica, the famous a uh, Serbian um, movie maker has reconstructed a Serbian village. Also from Emil Kostorica, the stone village in Visegrad. This is a 
also a theme park through the Serbian architecture from the Osman time to the Habsburg monarchy. And against Kopje, which is really uh, fitting into that um, uh, theme. So the projects should help me to take a position towards reconstructions, which can be anything. Reparation, memory, falsification of history, Disneyland, open air museum, historical education, tourist spot or monument. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation as well. Um, now we have five minutes of questions and of uh, answers. Anybody in the audience have any questions? Immediate question? I would like to have one. Because you started your lecture with this introduction of uh, having this strange identity, uh, getting to, uh, to Germany and having a career there. And um, uh, I would like to ask, uh, how would you define the advantage of being an outsider? Maybe this is what created the sensitivity, what, uh, what, uh, uh, what we could see also in your, in your body of work. So the advantage, what is the advantage to being uh, uh, a post-Yugoslavian in Germany as a, as a, as a photographer? Yes, it, it depends a little bit on uh, on the in the way or in the situation you are uh, on this cultural field. I would say it is an advantage, of course, because you have influence of different cultures, you have different opinions, um, and you don't feel uh, really uh, sticking together with this bubble or the other bubble. On Sometimes social issues, it was not an advantage to be a migrant in the 70s in uh, Germany. But uh, this uh, maybe strengthens also your idea of making your own uh, program, your own thing, and uh, shape a little bit your strengths. But of course, I think um, not only being uh, in two nationalities, is important. You can get this multicultural view also if you are traveling or if you're going uh, very much through the world and that is also the idea of teaching, making excursions and have a look to other people. Did you felt uh, kind of a curiosity when you, uh, when you arrived to Germany? Towards, towards who you are, where are you from, etc., etc., as an artist? Uh, when, when I arrived to Germany as, as a child, you mean, or...? Uh, when, when, you, when you started your artistic career, yes. this background created a curio curiosity about your um, knowledge or whatever, point of view. No, I, I think uh, this uh, thought I was uh, saying uh, today, it is more retrospective. So when I was uh, doing I just felt that I have an interest of doing something and I did it and I did it again the next year and so uh, decades passed by but after when I look back uh, that uh, then I find out that must be a motivation to uh, find out the identity through photography so photography was somehow my identity search and um, I think there's no solution or th there's no result uh, that uh, comes out, but it is an ongoing process that you are thinking uh, where you come from and uh, what is your position to this or that topic. Because I've, uh, sorry, is there any questions? Marion? 
just use the microphone, please, because it's, uh, this is how we can record. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation of your work. It's, uh, there were quite a few images that I didn't know. Um, uh, do you think that this, uh, uh, um, like in the urban uh, network of buildings, these the socialist modernism buildings and these uh, fake old buildings, they coexist? And um, uh, so do you, do you prefer one above the other, or, 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 or do you think that it, it, it is somehow like a normal part of, of our existence that we are like uh, uh, looking at two different types of past at the same time? Well, I think they are somehow connected. Um, so this uh, modernism was regarded, as I told, as an ugly or an unhuman architecture, but it was somehow a utopian uh, gesture to find out after Second World War to uh, make the difference or to distinguish from a period which was before. So it was somehow a uh, left uh, uh, way uh, of looking to the world or looking to society. And I think the modernism has m made people also very mad that they are very, really happy to see something old, so the good old uh, architecture. And maybe uh, modernism, ha has, modernism has also triggered uh, this uh, wish to be in the past. And uh, so I think it's uh, in both our, is our ideas and ideology and uh, but on the on very different uh, scale so they are very very far away from each other as i told i consider this as more of a left or or, or a right position in society or i will find out out if that is really true but this would be my thesis so but uh, after socialist modernism to to work with these reconstructions uh, this is for me very logical Thank you for your nice presentation as well. Uh, I just want to ask, because we've seen before your presentation about this Italian landscape uh, lecture, and how can you define that, how much is different your worldview from other photographers uh, regarding to your roots or cultural legacy or heritage? Do you think it's different as you take photographs about these buildings or cities because we've seen in many interpretation, uh, Skopje or you know, uh, Korea, uh, but how much is your worldview is different from other worldviews? Is there any specifics? Because you know, here we are trying to find what is the specifics our East European view, or, and, and because you see both sides, even the Western and the Eastern, can you see any, um, any specification in this? No, oh, that's really hard to say <laughs> yes, I for know. me to interpret my own work. Um, I'm not quite sure if uh, in a style or method methodology is, uh, uh, that there is really a difference. So if you would look to modern East European photographers um, and you would ask if this East or West European photography, it would be hard to find out. But that is something uh, what I um, observed. Maybe it is, it is more a question of mindset or picking uh, topics or uh, having ideas of project. And of course, uh, that was also a very good quote that uh, no photographer is alone. So all we are standing on the shoulders of others. And of course, for me, the new topographics had a role model in my work, or, or also German photography from uh, Becher School, that is a mixture, but uh, the interest of East European uh, cityscapes, maybe I uh, transferred these ideas in a, in a different space. 
So new topographics, not going to America, going to making new topographics maybe in East Europe. That, that was my idea. Thank you. Just to introduce you, Liz, Liz Wells, you are a professor of emeritus in photographic culture, University of Plymouth, UK. And um, we are very curious about uh, to hear your lecture. And then we will have a couple of minutes for quick questions and answers. And then immediately we will have, we will continue with the roundtable discussion. So stay with us. Thank you. So please. Thank you. Well, um, two things, first of all, one is to apologize for the fact that I don't seem to be able to stop the light reflecting in the picture behind me. So I'm trying to put my head so it doesn't disturb you. But anyway, can't do that. Secondly, um, it's fireworks night on November the 5th in the UK. So if you hear what sounds like shooting, it's in fact fireworks going off somebody's having a fireworks party outside my window. There's nothing I can do about it. I do apologize. Um, it might add some fun to proceedings. So what I'm going to do to start with is share screen. So thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm so sorry I'm not there in person, but it seemed to be very complicated indeed to um, move around Europe right this moment. I'm very, very pleased indeed to have a chance to share with you some of the things that I've been thinking about in terms of environmental photography. And as you know, there's been an increasing focus on environmental issues in Europe and acknowledging the impact of industrialization and globalization on our environment. So what and how has photography contributed within this? I want to introduce some investigations by photographers with whom I have worked as a curator or editor in order to reflect on aesthetics and photographic methods and ways in which photography can contribute to enhancing awareness of environmental issues. I recently curated a touring exhibition on seeds and sustainability, woodlands and well-being. And it's currently at a venue outside Glasgow where, as you probably know, COP26, tackling the risks and consequences of extreme climate change, is taking place right now. And of course, that coincidence is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about environmental photography today. I'm not going to take you on a tour of this whole show, but you can find a virtual tour at the website that's at the bottom of this slide. But I do want to think about some of the issues that are involved because plant diversity is rapidly declining globally. Several species are facing extinction. Whoops. Uh, through human-made disasters, such as war, as well as those associated with climate change, such as drought or flooding. Numerous countries are collecting and sharing food crop seeds, in effect, future-proofing nature. There are apparently over 1,400 seed banks located in countries that could experience natural disasters and wars. And obviously these vary in scale and purpose with some primarily concerned with national food security and others operating as scientific research centers often in partnership with universities. 
The global seed vault in the Arctic archipelago of Svalbard, Norway, opened in 2008, offering a deposit facility for seed specimens worth worldwide in case of crises. And it was constructed below ground in a former mining area to store duplicates of food crop seeds in frozen conditions. It's only accessible by permission of the Norwegian government. Uh, but to give you one example, um, Syria deposited uh, seeds uh, many years ago and in 2015 was the first nation to recall seeds because the Syrian seed bag was inaccessible due to war in Aleppo. So it's, 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 it's uh, you know, an actual living um, collection. And of course the category seed encompasses a huge range of germinating phenomena worldwide from tiny seeds imperceptible to the human eye or familiar food seeds such as sesame or watercress to Maldive coconut seeds that weigh about 18 kilos. It really is an enormous range. Prosperous Mountain by Heidi Morstang, which was made at Svalbard, explores the specific landscape of the Arctic along with the idea of international seed security. Of course, these film stills give little sense of the atmosphere conveyed. But she is interested in visual aesthetics as a means of exploring and rendering complex information into a form that is distinctive, memorable, and emotionally charged, but also elliptical. Her work is often haunting in its implications. And she draws attention to the Arctic as a wilderness that is itself fragile. She was also given sample seeds from flora that grow in a secluded valley in Svalbard, remarkably far north for plants. She cut the seeds in half and used an electron microscope to create these evocative internal seed landscapes that suggest fragility, although we know they have the potential to generate new plant life. Actually, when I look at them, I always think they look a bit like lunar landscapes. Uh, they are extraordinary. And when you think how tiny they are, all this is imperceptible to the human eye. And through use of a grid formation as a mode of visual taxonomy, she reminds us that there are intricate distinctions between different seed forms, whilst at the same time, she notes typical contours and textures. And as noted earlier, seeds are fundamental to life on Earth, but this is not just for humans, this is for many species. We are reminded not to take them for granted. Another example thinking about nature would be work uh, by Crystal Labar, who in this series considers light, mood, vegetation, and shifts in the atmosphere of place. She shoots on film using long exposures to register details that in both small and large prints, and her large prints are three meters wide, we see remarkably clearly. clearly. Domaine de Belleval is a managed estate in the Ardennes in northeast France. She often works through re photography, and this, of course, is an example. As you know, re photography is inherently systematic. A place is revisited to record change over time. It makes it very, very useful if what we're trying to explore is environmental issues or environmental change. And indexicality, that's to say the indexicality of, of photographs, lends authority and certainly underpins re-photography as a method. Although I would also suggest that authority derives from context and from our sense of the integrity of the photographer as a researcher. She has pursued several projects documenting animal movement or changing vegetation in forests, woodlands and estates in Europe. 
In this project, Field Studies, she used old photographs as her starting point. The story is that a set of glass plates were found at the Natural History Museum in London, unidentified. And she was invited in to um, re-photograph the slides in order to try and understand what they were. And then diaries with notes on the slides were found in a library at Kew Gardens, uh, also in London, but a very separate collection. So they were able to, in collaboration with botanists, they were able to put the two together and identify the locations to which the slides referred. And this example is in the Scottish Highlands. So as you see, the archive um, image offers evidence of how phenomena once appeared. And this is uh, nearly a hundred years previously. We see his photograph and then we see her panor panoramas um, where we see some of the changes that appear to have occurred. And she also shot several close-up images uh, so that there was a detailed rec um, record created of the vegetation as it is now. And there you just see low tide and high tide. So these are at you know, um, slightly different times of, times of year, but you're thinking about the fact that this is a tidal um, lake. Her most recent research on endangered forests in Japan and California is currently installed in the galleries at the Wellcome Trust in London. It's a British-based health research institute and at a hospital in East London. I mentioned it, I'm not going to show it, but I mentioned it because the installation is immersive um, with panoramic photographs, sounds and scents from the forests. So the audience experience is intended to be contemplative. There are seating areas within the gallery. Um, again, suggesting to us or inviting to us to reflect on what could easily be lost. And I mention it because it's on at the moment, I think through to the end of the year. So if any of you by any chance are able to be in London, it's walking distance from Euston Station and it's free to visit. And I think well worthwhile. And this, um, immersive installation is a different way of engaging audiences, I think, in reflecting on issues than looking at a photographic print on a wall or in a book. To continue to reference re-photography, but now um, sort of, um, going, going to coastal areas, uh, this is work by Jem Southam, British photographer, uh, who doesn't always use re-photography, but often does. And this series observed changes in the, as the cliffs crumble, uh, in this particular instance at Sidmouth on the southeast Devon coast. And it involved regular visits over a period of 18 months. He avoids the sharp light of summer and the poetics of shadow play. He doesn't want... Um, you know, sort of romanticism or the shadows to obscure the detail of what we can see. He doesn't want to create dramatic stories, although actually the rock falls that we see may seem um, dramatic. His new work is directly concerned with seasonal rhythms and shifts. So this series involved repeated visits to 10 spots on the River X in um, Exmouth. Let me just take my image away here. Uh, on the River X in Devon. He's recording weather, light, and of course, seasonal change, which means that the land-related land inquiries of this type take months or years, five years in this instance. Initially, he explored the river and some tributaries over the winter of 2010-11 and published a book, which was called The River Winter um, 211. Then, without initially having planned this, he continued over three winters, one characterised by extensive floods, one that he describes as rather nondescript, followed by one which was dry 
but cold. Oops. Environmentalist critique is never explicit in his work, although he did comment to me that River Winter comes closer than any of his other work to suggesting um, concern with the effects of climate change. The project, however, does not directly engage environmental issues, rather it arose from a philosophical question, an inquiry to which he keeps returning, namely, what is a river? Which of course is also an inquiry into fluidity and change, metaphorically and ecologically. In this example, exploring within one's own locality lends itself to in-depth knowledge and insight uh, that operates to counteract the blindness of the everyday. And he lives near enough that he can just go whenever he's free to do so. So he can develop an intimacy with the specific river locations that he's chosen to revisit. And with um, this set, uh, flood knots uh, actually result from fast water movement. Um, which means that floating objects get caught on branches or stones on the riverbank, especially when the waves are high due to rainfall and therefore the waters are running fast. The objects are carefully framed and the images are beautiful in a fairly classical manner. But the implications are complex. American photographer Robert Adams has remarked that beauty in art emerges primarily from form and significance from content. I would argue that context is also important. I live by the ex estuary, that is the river mouth downstream from where Jem Southam made the, this beautiful flood knot series. Where I live, we have flood barriers installed that are closed when tides will be particularly high. Southam's images are not overt in terms of environmental issues, but in the region, they have clear resonance. Sea rise threatens towns and villages all along the southwest coast of England. Swedish photographer, uh, Tyrone Martinson, specifically researches glacier melt as related to the risk of sea rise. He regularly visits Svalbard, where we were a moment ago with Heidi Morstang, re-photographing in locations that have previously been pictured. And he works in a team that also includes a glaciologist and a data analyst. If you look at the um, earlier um, image from Neil Strindberg, and then look at Tyrone's, you see immediately how, met, how much less slow and ice there is now. Given digital technology, Martinson can also insert old pictures into his recent ones in order to demonstrate the extent of change. He acknowledges his debt to Mark Klett and Byron Wolf, American photographers, who developed this digital amalgamation technique using archive photos uh, for their work on the American West. Of course, photographs have a specific angle of vision and focal distance, as well as content, reflecting what the photographer from the past selected and how it was framed. And one of the principles of re-photography is that later pictures are made from the same position as an earlier one to lend accuracy of reproduction of a specific view. And that, of course, is part of what has to be sought out when um, making initial um, visits to sites. Mark Clett, who I just mentioned, who is Regents Professor at um, Arizona State University and the noted leader in re-photography, acknowledges the limitations of the method, remarking that, and I quote him, Rephotography can show change, or rephotographs can show change, but they can't explain history. End of quote. However, as a systematic methodology, 
Repeat photography offers socio-historical evidence with which botanists, geologists, glaciologists in this case, and social historians can work to identify ecological shifts and assess the implications of the changes. You may, you will certainly be familiar with this location and you may be familiar with Andreas Muller-Pohl's work. Um, what's interesting, I think, is that environment, environmental issues are not always visible. How do you photograph the invisible? It's more challenging in terms of aesthetic tactics. So Muller-Pohl created what he describes as, quote, a poetic documentary view of the Danube, end of quote, that includes analysis of the chemical composition of the waters, um, marking the changing water quality of various different lo locations along the Danube. And as you see, he montages text within the image, although unless you can interpret chemistry, what comes across is not the detail so much as the reminder that what we cannot see should still be a matter of concern. So he describes the project as, quote, a pictorial atlas and a blood count all in one, an aesthetic and scientific compendium of Europe's most important river from the Black Forest to the Black Sea, noting quote, an enormous political terrain where ecological and economic interests clash with one another. Because of course, the toxicity uh, is largely to do with industrial waste. The angle of vision is unusual, not a viewpoint we would normally seek out, except perhaps as a swimmer with goggles. Bridges, boats and riverbanks tower over us as the camera documents them from water level. If we were Danube swimmers, the chemical analysis might, however, cause us to pause. Conaher Scott is also concerned with toxic legacies, but from an overtly activist perspective. You may be familiar with this project from when he worked with Greenpeace Hungary to protest a license issued in April 2011 by the Hungarian Environmental Protection Authority to allow a company to blend 166 toxic and 244 non-toxic industrial wastes into the already toxic red mud ponds of an aluminium factory on the banks of the Danube. I'm taking this very directly from the, um, uh, from the website uh, and also from the book. He told me that the images were shot quickly on a Sunday in two hours at personal danger as no one had successfully got into the guarded site from the ground before. The outcome was this book detailing the industrial waste and it was given by Greenpeace to various authorities. The photographer describes this as, quote, the burdensome gift. It is a free book or a free artwork, but it comes with an ethical obligation to take action. And in terms of the aesthetic strategy, uh, of course, what's interesting is that if you can't see uh, what is going on, then photographers have to find other ways of expressing um, the matters that are of concern. So here at Doonray Nuclear Power Station, which is in Caithness in the north of Scotland, um, it was discovered in 1997 that between 1963 and 1984, radioactive material had been pumped into the sea where it lay undiscovered on the seabed obviously contaminating marine life, including fish that we might eat. Fishing was then banned, but surveys show that the pollutants remain. And this diptych aims to question legacies of nuclear power in marine ecosystems world, worldwide, not just in the UK. 
So you see there's a montage of image and text. And in this instance, within poster style artworks, in order to ensure we get the full picture, the text, I don't, I don't have a way of getting close ups of a text, but the text details the waste and the small map um, shows uh, the locations of the toxic deposits. I've given you the website because there's a bit more information there, uh, which so that you can follow it up yourself. But I should add that he's about to publish an academic monograph on photography and environmental activism. The subtitle is Visualizing the Struggle Against Industrial Pollution. It's coming out from Routledge Publishers next spring. So uh, those of you who are interested in industrial um, pollution and environmental activism uh, might look forward to uh, seeing it. Unlike chemical pollution, plastic debris is normally visible. And we find it on every beach that we have visited. My final examples are by two British photographers who campaign on plastic pollution and whose work I included in a three person exhibition for Pingyao International Photography Festival in September this year. And here we see a plastic agglomerate by Andy Hughes on the poster at the entrance to the International Exhibitions Building. Hughes lives in Cornwall in southwest England, so his focus is on coastal environments. He is a surfer and a member of Surfers Against Sewage, which is a campaigning group. He identifies as a photographer and environmental activist like Conaher Scott. Apparently in 1989, whilst on a surfing trip in Wales, uh, which is uh, to the west of England, uh, he discovered an unusual material. It felt and looked like plastic rock. Since then, he has collected examples from coastal locations, including Portugal, Spain, Britain, and Alaska. And as you see from the um, text that, um, that he gives us, uh, these have gradually amalgamated and stuck together so that the stones, the pebbles, the plastic, the sand are coming together to create what appears as a rock, but it includes plastic debris. In 2013-14, he was one of three international artists and seven scientists uh, working together in Alaska on the project Jaya, the plastic ocean. A Jaya is a circular ocean current formed by wind patterns and planetary rotation. They suck in and shift marine debris, pushing and pulling the debris into new directions, moving water and waste material around the globe. He uses round prints to suggest the debris that we might see through a ship's porthole. And finally, and sticking with questions of plastic pollution, you may or may not be familiar with Mandy Barker's work. She collects plastic debris from the sea, objects that wash up on shores worldwide. Soup refers to plastic suspended in the water particularly in the so-called garbage patch. That's the North Pacific Ocean jar. She photographs, or well, in these examples, she photographed on a black velvet cloth using a single light source. They're actually rather beautiful images. She aims to draw attention to ecological risk, particularly the enhanced toxic hazards of the chemical action of salt water on deteriorating plastics. And all these materials are collected from beaches in the UK and in Hong Kong. So each image presents as a contemporary still life. She deploys beauty as a lure to attract viewers. And then we do a double take when we realize what we are witnessing paradoxical beauty. 
where once we would have enjoyed a painting of flowers or fruit and wondered at the marvels of nature, we now wonder at the horrors of what we are doing to our natural environment. Her work has been reproduced in magazines and newspapers worldwide and on posters in public spaces such as underground trains in London and Singapore, as well as in displays by the British Embassy and the United Nations in New York. This diversity is part of her strategy. Um, each context addresses different audiences and involves slightly different modes of viewer engagement. And, you know, as you see, she is very clear that if she didn't believe that her work could contribute to affecting, uh, to stimulating debate and affecting change or contributing to it, then she wouldn't be motivated to continue. Uh, like um, Andy Hughes, and also like Conaher Connor Scott, uh, the aim is to influence environmental thinking and behavioral change. And this series, which I included in the exhibition in China, is based on a research trip to Henderson Island, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site in the South Pacific, over 5,000 kilometers from the nearest landmass. And yet, all this debris collected there. Shelf Life, this particular series, references the title, references the fact that all these objects once existed on a shop or supermarket shelf, hence the barcodes for individual images. She found items from over 45 known brands and over 25 countries. Henderson Island is surrounded by coral reef, home to several unique species, yet it's now compromised by plastic pollution. Apparently on that trip, they recovered over six tons of plastic debris in various states of decay. And this week, to coincide with COP26, she released a new series, again drawing on images made at Henderson Island. In this case, birds that are dead or dying due to eating plastic. So collectively, we seem set to destroy the environment that we value. Photographers investigating environmental issues and ecologies explore through making images and reflecting on the implications of their findings, taking account of research from other disciplines relevant to their inquiry. The question is how much effect this can have and how photographers can work either gently or in an overtly activist manner to communicate uh, some of what uh, the results of their research. Cultural critic Frederick Jameson tells us that someone once remarked that we can imagine the end of the world more easily than we can imagine giving up current patterns of consumption and related energy needs. Needless to state, global corporate interests are at stake here and given the context of this particular week, uh, fortnight actually, at COP26, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how the various tensions around what can be done emerge. But from the point of view of thinking about photography, um, I'm always concerned to ask what art can do. And, you know, I'm a British photographer, John Kippen, I think, makes the point very succinctly. I love the analogy of um, art acting more like water and uh, eroding a stone rather than something that is hugely incisive or active um, because there is the possibility of a gradual development of awareness. And once people become aware of something, uh, then they start to, or we hope, they start to investigate, they start to think about it and possibly start to, in the case of environmental issues, change behaviour um, so that we are encouraged not only 
uh, you know, the art encourages not only to see images, but to see and act upon what is seen. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Liz, for your presentation. And uh, we have some minutes for quick questions of, and answers. Myself, I would like to uh, ask if, um, how can I say? So what was very interesting for, from your presentation is that is, it was the definition of the role of the artist. So in that sense, uh, uh, I would summarize, if you agree with what you said, like an artist is a, is a kind of a, a responsible person to create sensitivity towards these problems of, of the environment um, and try to find surfaces to spread this me message to a wider audience to understand what's going on. Something like that? Yes, absolutely. Um, but it's, it's a quieter, more evocative way of engaging with questions than say, um, there's that old saying, isn't there? If you want to send a message, send a telegram. Art works in more complex ways uh, and perhaps can be more layered than a very simple statement. Politics does a shouting. Art reminds us of values and can investigate thinking through you know, the photographers think through their practice, or at least, in my view, the most interesting, the most critical photographers think through researching through the camera, reflect on their findings, and then devise ways of communicating questions and findings to uh, invite other people to reflect on the implications of the findings. Um, and... Um... These artists who you mentioned, do they try to find more open surfaces like the gallery walls to, to be more effective in this process? Well, certainly Mandy Barker, as I said, um, you know, she uses poster hoardings. She's had uh, um, images on underground trains and so on, on the subway. Um, yes, I th all the, the three who are environmental activists would certainly be looking at all sorts of um, ways of speaking outside the gallery. All the artists I've mentioned, um, I think all the artists I've mentioned also produce books. Um, so, you know, that's a part of it. And also where there's moving image concern, for example, in Heidi Morstang's um, instance, she has shown at various uh, film festivals for short films. So, you know, a range of different contexts. Then the other point about gallery is it depends what sort of gallery it is. For instance, the gallery where the exhibition that I curated that's on during COP26 is uh, located, that gallery is in the same building as the Civic Library and the Civic Museum and as a small cafe. So, it's not a gallery that you go to just to see photography or any other form of art. It's a location that you go to because it's a civic center and you might happen to drop by the gallery while you're there. And I find that very interesting because I think you're more likely to get people who wouldn't normally go to, to galleries um, actually becoming engaged with work. Thank you very much. Anybody for further questions? Oriom. Hello, Liz. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I, I'm a little bit uh, always confused uh, uh, with uh, like, it's also, it's very important to see what is happening, but uh, there is a risk of getting used to uh, what we see. Uh, and 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 uh, I'm often uh, uh, feel that photography that is meant for the gallery wall requires so much effort from the normal public or the regular public to engage or to really understand that it's it's maybe um, 
it's something that it's a there's a risk of staying in this art bubble and 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 contemplate about the fate of the earth but like we just simply get used to what we see and 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 we get farther and farther away from really acting yeah yeah i mean there is and um and i think that's why all the artists whose work I've mentioned are also interested in publishing books, but that still tends to be artist books and in that bubble. But I think they would give talks and I think they also, you know, I think it's a problem. They're also all artists, no, not quite all, but um, many of them work in university contexts as well. So it's that broader bubble, but one that we're all at risk of being caught up in. On the other hand, uh, it's possible in many instances, Andy Hughes being a very good example, he's also active in a local um, environmental organization, Surface Against Sewage. So I think there is that risk and everyone has to ask themselves how they can communicate, out, reach outside the bubble, so to speak. How well we succeed, I don't know. I think the other problem is the... the um, you know, with photography, there's that sort of um, the shock effect. We get accustomed to seeing photographs that are more and more explicit and then they cease to shock us. And so on. That's always been argued about war photography and so on. It's a, and it's a it's a bigger argument. Than I'm summarizing. I think one of the things that's really important to think about when when, when photographers are working for book publication or for gallery or for museum contexts, as well as for talks and so on, is what strategies they can use so that you don't just repeat the same sort of thing more intensively, but you find different ways of communicating. Uh, I, You will all know more than me about The Burdensome Gift, the book that Connor Her Scott was involved in with Greenpeace, uh, because I deliberately picked a, an example from um, Hungary of his work because I thought some of you might be able to tell us, um, you know, respond to it. But the idea of giving a book, giving books to the policymakers uh, is another way of reaching out. That's not about bringing on a sort of general um, understanding, but it's about very directly addressing the policymakers and asking, you know, asking them not to turn a blind eye. Thank, yes, one more question. I have an additional mic. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I will have just one question that how much do you believe in the power of documentary photography at the age of, you know, in the post-truth and after the Photoshop uh, revolution? You know, because you projected some, some photographs uh, um, uh, uh, quite old photographs, uh, black and white, and nobody questions the reality of these photographs. But now when you are comparing to the new ones, me, we photographers know that how much can we modify reality and, but how, how does it change the, in the common sense? Uh, uh, the connection with the photography. So what do you think about this? Because that matters a lot in the strength of these photographs, what you projected. I think this is where the integrity of the photographer comes into play and the sense that the uh, photographs are underpinned by extensive research or working in, you know, where, where there's a collaborative team, as in the Crystal Labar's field studies work with botanists or um, as in uh, Tyrone Martinson's work with glaciologists and data analysts. So that's about the context and about the sense of seriousness of intent, of research intent that comes across. Now, whether it does come across is of course another matter and the context within which it will come across is another matter. So, but uh, yes, I mean, the, the um, I mean, photographs were always able to be manipulated. You know, they could be, uh, people could be airbrushed out of photographs and so on and so on, but it's incredibly easy nowadays. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say that there is no possibility of some sort of photographic truth, just in the same way as if we're speaking, 
you can tell lies with words and you can tell truths with words. And we all make a judgment about the status of what we are hearing or what we are seeing. Thank you very much. It was, it was very useful. Uh, Orion already have a first question to Ariana, if I understand well. Well, actually, uh, I think both to Liz and Ariana. Um, I wanted to ask at the end of Liz's uh, uh, presentation, is like what uh, role does the curator have in building this network of photographers who can act? Because uh, uh, often these uh, uh, festivals um, uh, create the platform having a theme or, or um, they are more accessible to the wider public than a, like an individual show. So like how, how, do, how do you um, take your responsibility uh, in this sense? It's not just the responsibility of the artist. Yes, I mean, I see the um, role of a curator very much as um, creating opportunities for work to be shown, but also creating circumstances wherein there's a dialogue between different bodies of work. And I have worked on two person shows. I once did a 40 person show at uh, Centre des Beaux Arts in Brussels, and that was uh, too many. So, um, but there's, there's, a, there's sort of something quite neat when you get three, five, seven, maybe up to 12 different bodies of work within a show, all addressing the same theme uh, from different perspectives. In terms of context, the um, Ping Yao International Festival, um, Photography Festival is a good example because I had been invited uh, by the director there to take a show uh, that was, a, well, it was two years or so ago anyway, it was before the pandemic. And the show that I wanted to take was one that was sort of quite complex to explain and install and so on. And then the pandemic happened and she contacted me and said, uh, not last year, but this year, this year, or at least at the beginning of this year, she contacted and said they were determined to actually have the festival this year. And would I want to take my show? And I thought about it and I thought, well, the show I wanted to do actually is not going to work without me being there and there being some context given. But what I could do is send work that is about plastics. Now, the logic of sending the work about plastics, including the last two um, series, well, there were two series by each of three artists. The third artist is uh, a woman called Gina, Gina Glover, who's done a lot of work on um, toxicity in the environment uh, and has also recently been working on uh, plastic bottles. I didn't show you that. Where does most of the plastic that is um, polluting our environment come from? Where is it made? It seemed obvious to send uh, the plastics or questions about plastics back to China. And it was interesting, actually, because I quite carefully with the shelf life example only included one with the barcode that was China because I knew that every single image had to go through the Office of Information and Censorship. Um, in fact, they it got through. But there is that sort of question of what you can show in the context in which you're showing it. So I thought that a festival with a lot of young people attending, although fewer than they normally have because they were restricted, and because they couldn't have their international curators come and visit and give talks and meet people and so on because there are no visas available, uh, even assuming people would want to travel. So that seemed to me to be an opportunity to actually address a theme in the place to which it felt to me to be particularly pertinent. And likewise with seedscapes that I mentioned at the beginning of um, my talk, the fact that it was possible that it could end up coinciding with COP26 in Kilmarnock, although it started in Bradford, Yorkshire, was very important to me. And it was also very important to me that it always showed in a civic building and not in an exclusive art gallery. 
Um, so again, that thinking about context. Uh, so I agree with you really. Festivals are great, providing the festivals aren't only um, somewhere like um, Photo London, which is very much about the art market and not so much about, um, it's, it's not a festival that's more open, but photography festivals, uh, some of them are very, very open, publicly open, and they're great venues. Thank you very much. Ariana, your opinion? Yes. Um, well, actually, um, I, um, I have two festivals in Italy that I've been um, working uh, as an artistic curator in the past 10 years. And specifically, one I wanted to mention is the one in the south of Italy, in Puglia, which is called Fest, where we actually showed Man uh, Mandy Barker's work in 2019 yeah. and it was an issue it was an edition that was dealing with with not with the environment specifically but with the land and then in in in, in many different ways and the beauty of that um festival is that mm, the majority part of half of the exhibitions are outdoors so they're actually really interacting with everybody it's a seaside town it's in august so it's full of people that are there just to have fun and go to the beach. But at the same time, you're walking around and you encounter all these different type of artworks. And um, Amandi's work specifically that year was indoors, but outdoors we had some other things. And it was amazing how we tried to work with the con contrasting the environment of the place where we were, a beach side town, um, with the works. So for example, this town is an old town. It has a huge ancient wall and underneath a beach, the city beach basically. And on this ancient wall, we made a 30 meter long um, image of a, a glacier. Okay, of course, right from um, referencing the, the, the climate change and the, and the situation of the, of the melting of glaciers. And so you had people, you know, ha hanging around and on the sea and taking a bath and, and behind them, there was this huge long um, image, which of course, all the explanation of the work, et cetera. Um, so it was very important for me that if we are working, and I think that festivals are the place for that, where you can actually interact not only with your peers and colleagues and professionals, you can, yeah, you can, you know, have a conversation, have a talk, a conference, a round table, but the fact that people kind of bump into these things while they're thinking about other things, but they encounter, again, a, a big um, iceberg, you know, on, on, in front of the beach, um, in, in fo photographic form, it really, really makes it much more powerful. Um, also at my other festival, Cortona on the Move, in 2019, we had, sorry, mm. we had, um, again, uh, the theme was um, the relationship between humans and the landscape. And again, not just ecology, but also traces of history, migrations, and all these um, interactions between human beings and, and the environment. And um, the, I think it was interesting to be able to go through this journey of how we relate as human beings to the environment, which is not just one unique, one-way situation, right? So we had works by Simon Norfolk, his crime scenes, again, for glaciers in Switzerland, Gideon Mendel's Drowning World, which is absolutely amazing work. Unfortunately, we couldn't show the five channel um, uh, film that he has, which is even more powerful, but, but just the images of people affected by um, uh, inundations all over the world from, uh, you know, Indonesia to, to, to the US. Um, and then we had work by Nadia Bseisos, a Jordanian photographer, and her beautiful long-term work on Infertile Crescent, basically that area in around uh, modern um, Jordania, which was the cradle of civilization, uh, Mesopotamia, you know, the, uh, and, and now is basically um, drying up because the underground water is brought to all the countries, the richer countries around it that need it. So um, we also had work by uh, Yaakov Israel on the illegitimacy of landscape. So referring more to borders and how borders are man-made and just break up not only human beings, but also uh, animal migration and, and, and change basically the, the meaning of the landscape. So I think that by creating a full festival that really focuses on the theme, which is something that I really like to do, you really uh, manage to um, speak again in a layered way and many different languages and also reach a much wider audience. 
one one just to add something to that one of the things i should have mentioned earlier is that if you're working with civic institutions or if you're working with festivals it's very often schools programs working with young people um all sorts of education events that are very much a part of the business of those sorts of organizations absolutely both of my uh, my festivals continue through october basically so you catch yeah, that catch that. that september yeah. that that moment when, yeah. when school starts and you get um uh, organ you can organize school trips which is absolutely uh, great yeah. continuing this line with responsibility here we have three professors from different schools and i really I'm, became very much interested how you can transfer this kind of sensitivity toward the world itself to the students. So, Roman from Bielefeld, Bielefeld. And, and Gabor Mati and Kudas Gabor Arion here from the Mumes School. So, so, here we have heard many examples from the point of view of the artists, from the point of view of the curators. But I think that there is another kind of responsibility, especially in these topics. And how do you feel? Are, are the students open? Is it easy to create this sensitivity? Please comment. So if I may start, uh, I think the students are very, very open to all these topics. So it's uh, if we are thinking um, topics, climate change, change of society, openness of society, queer feministic discourses, this is really interesting for our students. And uh, uh, in the moment, we are connected in one project, uh, MOME and also Bielefeld. And it is uh, the Breda Photo Festival. And the Breda Photo Festival has set the topic theater of dreams, which means let us dream a new world after pandemic, after all this uh, consciousness now that we have really problems with the climate change. And the students has to think about what to do, what could be a better world. That is really a challenge. I don't know how it's going on here in uh, in MOME, uh, my students are struggling and uh, we will see the result in January. But of course, it, these are open doors and I think we have to uh, go with that and uh, 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 go on these topics and, uh, and ask also what is uh, white, white supremacy, what are uh, different uh, genders, and that is, that is something what is uh, really, really, uh, especially on universities, uh, a big discourse. So, uh, yes, uh, it's our students, if I, if I tell them that they have to work about the climate change or whatever, they, they say, come on. So, uh, because, because this is a very average issue and from everywhere they can hear about this. I, I do it in another way. So I make a frame topic like empire of comfort or lies and secrets, what is a very open issue. And within this, they mostly find this issue. So, and I help them to, to work, for, work it out. And um, also they have to make a research. It's very important for my students just not to have their opinion from uh, only the internet, because as I mentioned before, we are living in the age of post-truth. So you can, you can uh, uh, tell very easy lies to yourself, what is very comfortable to you. And uh, yes, and, and, and that's why, that's how we guide them to, to find their own projects. And I'm, I'm happy and I'm always happy only in that case, if they, they find something relevant, what is what is has a power, what what will what can change the world with, okay? So, but they are they're changing the world in different levels, uh, and in different uh, graduates, they make it in a different depths. So, but that's how we do it um, in our project-based works. So, theater of dreams also a possibility in in our program now but it's not an obligation in this semester. Uh, I would like to uh, touch a, maybe a little bit less comfortable uh, aspect of it, uh, especially reacting to the presentation of Roman, uh, where you, are, you were addressing like straightforward political, uh, 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 how to say, strategies. Um, 
and I, in this time when uh, when you can quite easily experience your Instagram account shut down if you post something political or if you post something uh, a little bit uncomfortable, uh, I often f find that young people, mostly my students, um, feel a little bit afraid to you know to to be too aggressive on a topic or too open or or touch a topic which might be a little bit um, uh, a touchy to topic like uh, or which doesn't follow the mainstream i mean if their opinion is doesn't follow the mainstream uh, and uh, and and it's very interesting and very surprising sometimes how 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 much self censorship they they exercise or they they they, they have uh, they are sitting here a few of them <laughs> so uh, so it's also a criticism but um, but yeah that 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 I find uh, maybe the most problematic uh, with the young generation that 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 young people are because of the social media platforms they are trained to uh, conceal their real beliefs and real opinions and uh, and I think it's a great danger uh, for for the future of photography so, uh, so we kind of fight against this at the university uh, do you have any comments on on, on educating uh, new photographers or photographers on uh, of the future or we can go ahead okay so so one it's one one um, Ariana you have uh, switched off your microphone sorry were yeah. you asking us that question yeah. Sorry. yeah okay yeah. when i'm watching to this direction then it's it's you okay sorry <laughs> sorry well i think that one one very important thing that i stress when i when i i'm not a photographer and i've never been a photographer i've always worked as a photo editor or as a curator um in the past 20 plus years and for me, what makes a difference and what I stress when I, when I talk to, to students or emerging photographers is something that we mentioned before, the um, intention and the integrity. I think that is the key to uh, what makes a difference for a photographer to be also um, seen and then uh, shown. Um, oftentimes, uh, they concentrate very much on um, the story and the style of the story, the language, which of course are all very important aspects of building and of visual storytelling. But because of some of the uh, issues we mentioned before regarding also the, um, how to communicate, how to, sorry, how to um, go beyond that layer of disbelief that images today create in a wider audience. I think that building your, your um, photography career through a coherent body of work, because your intention and integrity is clear, is what will then ultimately make a difference. Uh, I'm speaking mostly about documentary photographers because that's what I've been mostly working with in the past um, in my, as my background. So uh, as much as one needs to develop its, his own style, his or her own style, uh, look for stories that are original, that are interesting, but I still think that that initial attitude and intention in um, how you're bringing that story out into the world is one of the most important aspects. Um, my, it's very interesting also to compare these topics from that point of view that Ariana, you were presenting us um, a line of different generations who are very much um, um, uh, focusing on a local issue, how they criticize, how they they romanticize or whatever the local environment, the local landscape. And it was very interesting for me that you were telling three categories, which I like very much, regarding the uh, question what you asked if there is an Italian school, and you said that if there is a team a coherent team, methodology, and common vision, then this is the platform to, to speak about something like that. And mm -hmm. um, 
we don't want to go into deeper to, to the history of Hungarian photography, but it was very interesting for us here that whatever you told from whatever decade, it was totally different from how landscape was understood, for example, here in Hungary. So it was absolutely, uh, it made us absolutely understand that, yeah, even if we are speaking of global aspects of photography or whatever, but there are very strong local roots and local background backgrounds. And it was the same case with Roman's presentation that we came to the solution that the background where he's coming from, maybe this is something which creates, uh, creates an interest. And meanwhile, Liz, it was very interesting to hear that, that, uh, that uh, you were using photography as a, as a tool to raise questions or sensitivity to topics which are absolutely global, which are absolutely a problem in all corners of the world, also in the Hungarian uh, rivers, et cetera, et cetera. And in that sense, I think that it, this is one of the most uh, uh, or the deepest depth in every student or in every, also not just in the students, but I also see in the photographer, the young, young photographers who start their generation, how to be global while acting local, you understand. So what would be your message if this conference or is, or because this symposium, it, it's in the moment. So what would be your message regarding this doubt, globality versus locality? And it, of course, I also want to ask this question to the, from the others. Um, two things there. One is, if you're, uh, the local often has global implications and we can't understand what's going on globally unless we can actually investigate in detail locally. So it's not an either or at all and it's absolutely valid to be working where you are. And the other thing is, you know, instead of it, get on with the work, get on with the research because uh, so often I come across, I've come across students uh, in the past who are sort of imagining they're going to be successful like this great photographer. But actually this great photographer did an awful lot of work and it's only as a result of, a, of the work, the persistence and the dealing with the setbacks that you actually begin to find the voice that begins to get recognised that allows you to then find spaces to speak beyond your immediate environment so it's 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 no use saying i want to be this uh it's important to say i want to do this does that make sense yeah thank you ariana yes i think this is uh actually i was i was looking back at my presentation and um it's interesting how many aspects that these photographers i'm talking about the contemporary ones now the more the younger ones let's say um that are working on more environmental and social and social political and geopolitical issues within italy um i look at some of these images and suddenly i'm reminded of mitch epstein's work american power so again how, he also looks at the landscape and how the, the power is embedded in some of the details in the landscape right so so immediately i'm like thinking Italy, US. So, okay, we can, you know, it's, we're, we're the same thing, right? Even if, if we are not considered, you know, the, um, uh, such a powerful country, but there's those, those problematics related to um, the effect of our contemporary capitalist culture on our planet and on our local landscape are so evident. So I think that this, this is very important that photographers work on local issues because mm -hmm they don't need to go to the other side of the world and now even more importantly that they look around their neighborhood because that's how things get connected that's how we connect things and the photographers are the ones that can actually show it visually which is the most direct language right to to be able to communicate this thing so i don't think it is that difficult to do that connection local uh, global as long as the research on that subject matter that they're doing close to home is again deep profound and done with integrity and intention Roman? yeah i would think uh, 
<clears throat> global at local is not necessarily a contradiction because uh, Bielefeld is a local global or Germany is a local global. So there are a lot of uh, issues you can find in a local area which are, has a global extension. Mm -hmm. Or in other words, uh, when we are thinking about making an excursion, and then I say, let's go to Magdeburg, East Germany, and they are bored, my students. And then they, they want to go to Italy, to Naples, or they want to go to, to England or, or whatever. But then I say to them, Magdeburg is one point on the globus, and Neapels is also one point on the globus. So it is in its very interesting to go to a place you don't know. But uh, I, I wouldn't say it, it is a contradiction as long you are working uh, on topics and uh, make a research and have a look if this topic is also somewhere an issue or a question. Um, in my opinion, uh, I think it's very important the heritage, the cu cultural heritage, what we have, and not worth to forget about it. And it's not a good uh, technique to try to erase the history, as we've seen on your photographs, or rebuild it entirely. Just it's very important to learn from these things. So that's that's one of the point. Uh, what uh, Ariana also mentioned in her presentation that that's how how she started from very early ages from the 17th century. So we have such a thing everywhere, but these global connections always must be found. I think it's uh, very obvious, and um, and you know that kind of critical attitude, what what they must have around all the information, what they have, it's essential. And, and curiosity. That's that. These are the key words. As a photographer, has oh disappeared. <laughs> I don't know if they can hear us, but yes. anyway, yes, we yes. can still hear you. Yeah. Just yeah. the screen yeah. disappeared. Yeah, here. Oh, yeah. I was frightened a bit. Okay, so <laughs> that that uh, this is very essential. This curiosity and critical attitude and keeping. The, not the traditions, I say, I say this kind of uh, values, what is coming from, from history and so on, even bad ones, not uh, especially values I'm talking about, but experiences. Are you? Oh, sorry, I was a little bit confused by the loss of, <laughs> <laughs> loss of the screen. Um, the so are, are you and Alice, are you there? Yes. Oh, okay. super. Yes, yes, Wonderful. we can hear. Okay. Um, I was, uh, I was, uh, I'm thinking about like what would be the message? What would be the message? Uh, is that I see that uh, students or young photographers are often very, very closely connected globally with their own age group, and they know exactly what the others in the U.S the, the 25 year old youngsters in the US do and like, and also they know what the 25 year old youngsters in Korea like, but there is this, I think it's very important, but actually I would connect to Mathieu, like it needs to, this gap needs to be widened. Um, and um, I mean, like this, this age uh, barrier has to be broken. Uh, uh, or, or, or expand it somehow, um, because it's very easy to uh, jump on this. Uh, I don't know if this if it's the correct English phrase, but on, on, on the bandwagon with everyone, uh, what everyone is interested in right now, and yeah. do the same thing. And 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 uh, that's 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 the that's that's maybe the cookbook to be boring. If you are doing the same thing that what everyone is doing right now, then you are just one of everyone mm. if you if you if you just do to be okay so the message is that be honest to yourself do i really like what everyone else is liking if i did really like that it's okay to do that but then <laughs> that's i think it's a little bit a uh, little bit of a trap um so it's worth worth experimenting and worth uh, uh, 
not being up to date and popular because it might be that like in 15 years what you what is not popular right now is going to be super popular so it's that's that's that would be the message but i think it's very difficult <laughs> yeah but do. please comment also what what was the general question so local and global so what would be your i think that's the that's, that's the answer that's the answer okay it's um just one more thing I would like to add what Orion said that that this is very important to find themselves their own language and not to follow their peers or or the trends and and that's that's also belongs not only the the uh, themes but but also the this kind of how they make the photographs it's another it's another issue what is very general and you can you can see it influenced and sometimes they are copying even the lights even the perspective and so on uh, what, what what they can see on the internet or what, whatever so that's why i mentioned this kind of going back to the roots a little bit and look around and and invest make investigations in in, in any fields of life um, um just funny that just two days ago we we had a i also had my class and we had some students and we came also to the solution that it's it's better to be inspired not by sometimes not by uh, contemporary photography of the same generation but from totally different genres from literature movie etc etc um, what is interesting for us here as this is the second part of this working in context project or, 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 or symposium, is that we started from the idea to, to identify a little bit uh, the geography of, uh, of photography. And now, in today, it, it seems for us very interesting that we came to a subtopic. And this subtopic is how we identify ourselves through the environment, which is certainly in photography the landscape what we were speaking of now urban landscapes natural landscape the comparison of the two a historical context of uh, of urban landscapes and and it was it was really uh, inspiring to, to 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 narrow down the problem to narrow down the situation to this this uh, this genre or to this topic and i think that we we got we got a lot of new inspiration and new uh, new aspects of that and uh, for me the i would not say conclusion but uh, but uh, the um, uh, somehow the idea of 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 the essence of of uh, of the speeches and the conference was that um, that if we would we would like to observe something or to identify something it's much better to identify it in a smaller scale maybe in a smaller problem and not always to turn around very general questions and very general aspects like okay who we are okay what we are doing etc where we are coming from but if we get to an example then this example it can be also a topic a theme or it can be a, a genre in, in in a special uh, country or whatever then maybe we get closer to different solutions unfortunately this was not a question it was just a it was just a comment of mine and um, and uh, and maybe a last remark or some something like that but if anybody of you would like to comment or or conclude somehow this uh, uh, this this hour what we spent these hours what we spent together please do that i i just have one notice and one question what i wanted to ask ariana after the presentation and 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 i think it belongs to this uh, to this uh, question as well that that for example in your experience you you presented many landscapes and some of these landscapes are well known taken by other photographers that can you uh, can you define a kind of characteristic of uh, for example the italian photographers how they are doing in in a different way is there any differences between making the same theme, the, the photographs about the same issue or the same theme, or more or less the same theme, by other photographers like tourism. We know many photographers work about this issue and and so on. That that so, for example, as you you gave us a very wide perspective of this landscape, photographers, can you see a characteristic in that field, for example? Um, not really, actually. I mean, I think that. Um... 
just be, what we were saying before about the local global, the fact that some of these issues um, how, and how they're played out in the morphing of the landscape and how photographers and artists look at the landscape is really a common ground uh, in different parts of the world. And of course, you know, the, the background will be different because the places are different, but the, the issues and the way they are uh, dealt with uh, somehow um, are very similar. Um, and I have thousands of um, hundreds of, of examples in my head um, because this is a subject matter that has been interesting me a lot in the past few years. But I think that what is interesting to see is how the, especially the, the, the newer generations are able to dig into landscape continuously and continuously find other layers of significance that are totally related with what's happening in the world. So from the original, I, um, from the first uh, examples that I showed uh, in the 70s, 80s and 90s, um, they were still nobody was talking about the environment. Nobody was looking at the landscape uh, because there was pollution, but they were looking maybe at how our um, cities were growing, uh, about the suburbia, the suburban urban planning. And so how photography of landscape was really, really going parallel with what's actually happening uh, around us. And today the questions are on borders, migration, environment, and all the photographers, most of the photographers they're looking at that, at that look at these often include it and contextualize it in a landscape photography called. Um, and I've seen that throughout in different countries. I mean, I can't speak, you know, for the whole wide world, but I do see that attention to um, a new way of interpreting what's around us, whether it's an urban landscape or a natural landscape through the eyes of contemporary issues that are really urgent today. Thank you. Other comments? Yeah. Yep. So um, uh, I was, uh, I had the luck to be part of the Sense of Place exhibition that uh, Liz was curated. And, uh, and when I went to see the exhibition, it was, for me, it was very, uh, actually sh uh, uh, a shocking experience to see this, the, 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 the grouping of the works by West, North, South, and maybe East was, the, was one part, like in this, uh, how Europe was divided. And, uh, and, 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 and I could detect that the Mediterranean photographers have a very, uh, not very, but maybe slightly different approach than the Western photographers. And it was very nice to see, first I didn't like this because it, I found it, uh, how to say, maybe too easy, but then I realized that it's on, it serves a purpose, a very interesting purpose. Like there, there is a difference on how you see the landscape by through the language that you are speaking so it's like if, if it's a different different language different cultural background and you spot different things in the same sometimes even the same language uh, same um, uh, landscape uh, because there were actually some photographers who were uh, crossing each other's borders you know, like photographing in uh, in the same country and then still having a distinct Mediterranean approach, a little bit more gritty, a little bit more dirty, <laughs> uh, and, 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 uh, and Germans or the, uh, or the, or the, or the uh, British were more like, you know, accurate. <laughs> that, was, that was my, that was my uh, 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 experience of this. So thank you, Liz. That was, that was a very uh, in, important lesson in that exhibition. So can, can I can I comment on that quickly and say that it's st that started as north, central, and south, and then each one subdivided because it was incredibly difficult to handle that much work and conversations with those many people. 
But actually, as soon as I started thinking in that way, I realized that we were then drawing attention to artificial borders in a way, because the land doesn't, the land and landscape doesn't coincide with um, the political nationhoods. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a much longer discussion, actually. It'd be fascinating to have it with you sometime. So thank you all very much for your comments and your valuable presentations. And on the end, I would like to thank for the organizers and the sponsors of this, of this conference. So first of all, the MoMA University who, who organized this and um, uh, also their Robert Kappa Center for Photography, and also the Natural Cultural, National Cultural Fund who supported this um, project. And we also have some, had some voluntary students who were also participating in the project. I also, there are rather many, so I just would like to thank them in a group that they also joined us in the preparation of the, of the project. I also want to mention Judith Gellert, who was, was one of the curator of the whole project and uh, we also have a small exhibition downstairs what unfortunately you cannot see but uh, we really suggest to check the projects uh, on our website because i think that they are really meaningful they are kind of best of uh, project of the of the MoMA university and um, enjoy the rest of the night this is what i can say <laughs> so thank you very very much for coming and hope you also enjoyed the presentations. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. Bye. Bye bye.